Hi, and welcome to lecture three. This lecture is going to be on gates, function blocks, and combinational logic design. And it's really the second part of the combinational logic lectures, which started with lecture two. In this lecture, we're going to cover primitive and complex gates, some of which we have already covered before, some of which is new, the design procedure for combinational logic design, then function blocks, such as enabling, decoding, and selecting, then multiplexes and addition function blocks. So there are other gate types that we haven't had a look at before. And the question would be, well, why would we use them? And the reason is that implementation can become more feasible and it can lower the cost. It also can be a powerful way to implement the Boolean functions and it provides a convenient conceptual representation. For our purposes, we're going to classify gates in two groups, one being primitive gates and the other being complex gates. So a primitive gate is something that can be described using a single primitive operation type, which is AND or OR plus some sort of optional inversion. A more complex gate is a gate that requires more than one primitive operation type for its description. So first of all, we'll go over the primitive gates. So this slide shows a NAND gate. The NAND gate has this sort of symbol. As you can see, it's very similar looking to the AND gate, as in X and Y and Z, but it has the addition of a NOT at the end. So it's an AND function with a NOT applied at the end. This function gives an answer like this. So for example, in this case, we have X, Y, and Z going in. So therefore it's X and Y and Z. And then this little bubble on the end represents the invert function. So we'd also call this an and invert and with an invert over the top. So by applying De Morgan's theorem, we can get a invert OR, which is the same as an AND, and that is we have each of the inputs being inverted before entering the OR, and then we have, for example, in this case, not X or not Y or not Z. And so this NAND symbol, which is also called an invert OR symbol because the inputs are inverted before they're all together, so the AND invert and the invert or both represent the NAND and we have the two of them because sometimes having both makes the visualization of the circuit function easier. You should also recognize that a NAND gate with only one input is just the same as an inverter, just the same as what we had as an inverter. The NAND gate is a natural implementation for the CMOS technology in terms of both chip area and speed. And the NAND gate can implement any Boolean function, and so it's often referred to as a universal gate. The NAND usually doesn't have an operation symbol defined because NAND operation is not associative, and dealing with non-associative mathematics is difficult. This is a NOR gate, illustrated by the following symbol, and the NOR function is that we have X, OR, Y, OR, Z, all inverted. Previously for the NAND gate, we had invert or that is invert and then the or here we have an or invert or first and then invert afterwards that is not or and once again this little bubble on the end represents the invert function once again we can apply de morgan's law and that gives us an invert and which is also a nor and that is where each of the inputs is first inverted and then they're anded together. So not X and not Y and not Z. And as before with the NAND gate, we have here an OR invert and an invert AND, both representing a NOR gate. It can sometimes make the circuit function easier to visualize when we have both of these. As with the NAND gate, a NOR gate with a single input is just the same as an inverter. The NOR gate is a natural implementation for some technologies other than CMOS, both in terms of chip area and speed. NOR gate is also a universal gate, and the NOR gate also doesn't have a defined operation because NOR operation is not associative, and once again, non-associative mathematics is difficult. So now we get into slightly more complex gates, and we have an exclusive OR or an exclusive NOR gate, and the exclusive OR function can be implemented directly as an electronic circuit, as a true gate, or implemented by interconnecting other gates used as a convenient representation. The exclusive NOR function, this one that's all in red, is the NOT of the XOR, so that is XNOR. And so as I said, the XOR and XNOR gates are complex gates. Here's the truth table for the XOR and XNOR gates. So the XOR function means X or Y, but not both. So in this case, we have X being zero, Y being zero, therefore X, X or Y is zero. 
In both of these cases, we have just one of them being one and the other being zero. Therefore, the output function is ones for here and here. But in this case, since both x and y are one, then the output is zero. The x nor is simply the inversion of that. So anywhere that there was a zero here, there's now a one. These two ones become zeros and this zero becomes a one. The x nor function is sometimes called an equivalence function, which is denoted by these three parallel lines. And when you think about why that would be, it's saying, is this one the same as this one? Yes or no? And in this case it is. Is this the same as this one? No, it's not. Is this the same as this one? No, it's not. Is this the same as this one? Yes, it is. So there we have the one output where the inputs are the same as each other or equivalent to each other. So this is why we would call it an equivalence function. This is what the XOR implementation looks like. And it's really just a simple sum of products implementation using the following structure. So if you follow this through, we can see why XOR gives an output of true when only one of them is one and the other is not. In the case of, for example, zero, then we would have zero here, one here, this and this is no, one here, zero here, this and this, no, zero, zero gives zero. In the one zero case, we have one here, and since this is zero, there's a one here, and this is a zero here, and this is zero here. One and one gives one, zero and zero gives zero, one or zero gives a one. And that would be the same if we flipped the x and the y around, if we had x being zero and y being one. And for the case where both x and y are one, then we get one here, zero here, zero here, one here, zero, zero, zero or zero gives zero. The second implementation is using only NAND gates, whereas the first one was using AND, OR, and NOT gates. This one's only using the NAND gate. We can follow this one through for the zero, zero case. Zero and zero give zero, NOTed gives one. Zero propagates through to here, one through to here, one through to here, zero through to here. Zero and one gives zero, NOTed gives one. This one also gives one. One and one gives one, NOTed gives zero. And then you could, as an exercise, follow this through for the other possible values of X and Y. This is the symbol for XOR. So it looks just like an OR, but it has this extra line here. And this is the symbol for XNOR, which is the same as the XOR, but with this little bubble on the end. And these XOR and XNOR are really only defined for two inputs. So there's only shape symbols for the two inputs. Otherwise, you have to group them. And we'll show that later on. Exclusive OR and exclusive NOR gates are very useful. They can be used in adders, subtractors, multipliers, counters, decrementers, incrementers. We define the XOR function in this way, which is with this symbol, the plus with the circle around it. And it's equal to X and not Y or not X and Y. So the exclusive NOR function, which we called the equivalence function, looks like this, just the XOR function complemented and remembering what we proved in the truth table with the equivalence makes sense here that it's x and y or not x and not y. As I said before, strictly speaking, the XOR and XNOR gates don't actually exist for more than two inputs and instead we would replace them by odd and even functions, which we'll look at in later slides. The XOR and the XNOR function can actually be extended to three or more variables and for more than two variables, we call it the odd function or modulo two sum, mod two sum, not XOR. And that would be the case for this example here, X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z, which expanded out looks like this. And you can keep in mind that the complement of an odd function is the even function. The XOR identities are like this, X, XOR zero is equal to X, X, XOR X is equal to zero, X, XOR one is equal to not X, X, XOR not X is equal to one. The order that they're put in doesn't matter. So it can be like this. We can also group it in this way using the brackets and all of these three are equal to each other. 
A buffer is another gate. You've seen the not gate before where we had the little bubble on the end. In this case, the buffer is simply the function equals to whatever the input is. So we might ask, why would you use a gate that gives exactly the same as X? Why wouldn't you just use a wire? It's so actually a buffer can be used as an electronic amplifier, so to condition the signal in some way, and that can improve the voltage levels and increase the speed of the circuit operation. Now we get into the odd and even functions. The odd and even functions on the K-map form a checkerboard pattern. The ones of an odd function correspond to the min terms having an index with an odd number of ones. So odd function, odd number of ones. The even function, min terms with an even number of ones. Min terms that have an index with an odd number of ones. Seven, which is equal to one, one, one. So it has three ones in it, so odd number of ones. Another example of min terms that have an index with an odd number of ones would be four. And notice how this is an even number, but it equals to one, zero, zero. So it has one, one, an odd number of ones. A min term that has an even number of ones, maybe six, equal to one, one, zero. And then another one would be, for example, 15, which although it's an odd number, is eight plus four plus two plus one. So there's four ones in that. So this 15 is a min term that has an index with an even number of ones. So here we're showing it on a K-map and you can see how it makes up this checkerboard pattern, this being zero, one, two, three. So two is another example of a min term that has an odd number of ones in it. So here let's do an example of an odd function implementation. We've got to design a three input odd function. We have inputs of X, Y, and Z and we want to use two input XOR gates. We recognize that the function could also be broken up in this way. And then we have now two input XOR gates. We could say X and Y going into an XOR gate, which is going into another XOR gate with Z. So there is it drawn much more elegantly. So we're going to design a four input odd function this time, the inputs are W, X, Y, and Z, and we want to use two input XORs and XNOR gates. So once again, we'll divide this up and then draw this up with our W and X, XOR, and then our Y and Z. So yep, that's the same as what we got. Now the main thing is just seeing that you can group these two together so that you can use the two input XORs and seeing that even if you group it like this, that the grouped function is equal to the original function and what it looks like in a circuit.